Let me, I have the pleasure of uh, introducing our first guest this morning, our first speaker this morning, excuse me. His name is Dr. Leonard Hayflick. He is, uh, Dr. Perfect, uh, he is presently a professor of anatomy at the University of California, San Francisco, past president of the Gerontology Society of America and founding member of the Council of the National Institute of a on Aging at the NIH and former consultant to the National Cancer Institute and the World Health Organization. Dr. Heiflick is best known for his research in cell biology, virus, vac virus vaccine development, and mycoplasma. In 1962, he discovered that contrary to, contrary to what was believed since the turn of the century, cultured normal human and animal cells have a limited capacity for replication. This phenomenon was known as the Hayflick limit. He's probably got the longest bio in here, so I'm not going to read all of it. I will leave the rest of that reading up to you, but I'd like to welcome our first speaker, once again, Dr. Leonard Hayflick. Good morning. I want to um, discuss what I believe to be are the major aspects of the finitude of life. And they are uh, numbered one, two, three, and four. The first one is aging. The second is longevity determination. The third is age-associated diseases. And finally, death. I intend to define each of these uh, items with the exception of the last one, uh, which, will, which will not be a part of my presentation, other than to say that death is nature's way of telling you to slow down. The other three remind me of a, uh, an experience that a European colleague of mine had when he arrived at Kennedy Airport and was detained there by the customs inspectors when they opened his briefcase and found in there a manuscript that was entitled The Effect of Free Radicals and Other Foreign Agents on Red Cells. <laughs> I'm not wanting you to experience that kind of uh, difficulty. I'm going to try to define these, each of these three items as best, uh, as best as I can. The first aspect of the finitude of life is aging. There are only two ways in which age changes occur, uh, can occur. The first is a purposeful program driven by genes or a stochastic or randomly occurring cascade of accidental events. There is a great deal of evidence that aging is indeed a stochastic process. There is no direct evidence that supports the notion that aging is a result of a genetic program. No gene that codes for a generally accepted biomark of aging has ever been found. Second, animate and inanimate objects require no instructions to age. Third, a huge body of knowledge exists indicating that age changes are characterized by the loss of molecular fidelity in both animate and inanimate objects. Dysfunctional molecules accumulate. So the common denominator of all theories of aging is the loss of molecular structure and consequently function that's caused by the intrinsic thermodynamic instability of complex biomolecules. Until about five or ten years ago, it was believed that the second law of thermodynamics did not apply to aging. That, the second law has been revised recently by physicists and now includes biological material. The new interpretation of the second law says that entropy is the tendency of concentrated energy to disperse when unhindered, regardless of whether the system is open or closed. 
The prevention of chemical bond breakage, among other structural changes, is absolutely essential for the maintenance of individual life and the continuity of species, at least until reproductive success. For those of you who may have forgotten your uh, course in molecular biology, this gives you some idea of a complex biological molecule. Biological material contains the most complex molecules on the planet. Inanimate objects uh, don't come close to this kind of complexity. And indeed, the kinds of changes that can occur as a loss of energy in complex biomolecules, as you see illustrated here with a bond break where the red and uh, blue arrows exist, will turn this complex molecule into either a non-functional one or a dysfunctional one. So the new interpretation of the second law of thermodynamics leads to this. The tendency for all complex biomolecules to lose energy is never entirely eliminated. It's circumvented for varying periods of time by repair or replacement processes. So the maintenance of function of molecules is essential for the continuity of life. The length of time that these processes continue in vital systems determines individual longevity. The repair and replacement machineries are also composed of complex molecules, so they too obey the second law and therefore place a limit on longevity. It's very much like the repair shops to which you take your automobile also age, and indeed the repair shops of the repair shops will age and so on uh, ad infinitum. When the repair and turnover systems start to fail, age changes begin to occur. So what is aging? Aging is the random systemic loss of molecular fidelity that occurs from life's beginning, but repair and turnover processes are capable of maintaining the balance in favor of sustaining molecular fidelity until reproductive maturity. After this time, the balance shifts in favor of the continued loss of molecular fidelity, and these losses, of course, are expressed at higher levels of organization, tissue, cell, tissue, organ, etc. The progressive loss of molecular fidelity increases vulnerability to age-associated diseases. And that's a key concept. The time when the balance that favors repair and synthesis over the accumulation of dysfunctional molecules shifts occurs after reproductive maturation. Through natural selection to repair and synthesis systems have evolved energy states sufficient to maintain their fidelity until most animals reach reproductive success. If that didn't happen, then the species would vanish. Why are most diseases age-associated? Age-associated changes and pathology result from secondary modifications that occur after the basic unrepaired age changes have modified molecular structures. These secondary modifications reveal themselves at higher orders of organization as the manifestations of age-associated diseases, such as annoyances, and I've listed some here that all of you are familiar with, and the increased vulnerability of molecules after they've undergone unrepaired age changes explains why most diseases occur in old age. It also suggests that all age-associated diseases may have a common etiology in the milieu that has been established by the accumulation of dysfunctional molecules. Now, why is aging not determined by genes? I'm sure you've all read and heard of uh, the opposite belief. Age changes occur spontaneously in the molecules of both animate and inanimate objects as molecules dissipate energy, lose structural integrity, and finally lose their functional capacity. Genes are unnecessary to drive a spontaneous process. Blueprints contain no information instructing a car how to age. 
your car is brilliant. It knows exactly how to age without any instructions having been written in the blueprints that designed it or anything that you might do other than to try to correct the aging process in that kind of inanimate object. I'm going to take a little side excursion now because the management has asked me to explain um, some of my earlier work. And I've been asked to explain the history of my role in, number one, discovering the mortality of culture in normal human cells. Second, my suggestion that this phenomenon was aging or longevity determination at the cellular level. And finally, my discovery that only abnormal cancer cells are, are immortal. And here's a very brief history. In 1960, I torpedoed a dogma that was held since 1900 when I discovered that contrary to the belief that all cultured cells are immortal, I found that only normal, uh, normal cells are mortal and that they have a division capacity or a replicate capacity of about 50 cell population doublings in fetal cells. There are fewer replications possible in the cells from older donors. I also found that only cancer cells are immortal in contrast to mortal normal cells. I also suggested that in normal cells the replication limit was an expression of aging at the cellular level. And that seems to have stood up over the years. I also determined that there must be a counting mechanism. There are several ways in which this was done. One simple way was to freeze the cells at varying population doublings from, let's say, 5 to 50, and then reconstituting or resurrecting the ampules containing cells at various population doublings. And for example, if an ampule was frozen at the 20th doubling, then a year later you would reconstitute that ampule and find that there were 30 doublings left. If you froze it at 10 doublings, six months, a year, 10 years later, you found that there were 40 doublings left. So clearly the cells had a memory. We made an effort to determine the location of that memory and demonstrated clearly that it was located in the nucleus. Then in 2003, you may recall that Liz Blackburn and Carol Greider won the Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology for the discovery of the molecular explanation for my earlier findings. They found that telomeres, the ends of chromosomes composed of nonsense nucleotides, are lost at each round of DNA replication until they reach a critical short length that signals to the cell to stop dividing. Then the, this group discovered the enzyme telomerase, which when expressed adds on the missing nucleotides which explains why cancer cells are immortal. This is a representation of that in a kind of uh, dramatic uh, way, but it shows the missing um, telomeres at each round of DNA replication. And finally, uh, each replication of DNA in normal cells, there is a loss of telomeres, as I mentioned, uh, I won't go into the details of how that uh, operates. Uh, the telomerase, as I mentioned, adds these missing nucleotides that would occur in normal cells so that the length is maintained in cancer cells and consequently they're capable of replicating indefinitely. Uh, telomerase is the only reverse transcriptase known to occur, occur in normal cell biology. And in fact, the expression of telomerase is probably the most distinct, uh, distinctive property that explains the difference between normal and cancer cells. Let's talk now about the second aspect of the finitude of life, and that is longevity determination. It, it seems obvious that age changes must occur in molecules that first exist without age changes. Longevity is determined by the length of time that synthesis and maintenance 
processes can retain the biological activity of their substrate molecules. So you have a balance going on. You have the second law of thermodynamics produ reducing or spreading energy from complex biomolecules that causes them eventually to uh, dysfunction or not function. And then you have the process of repair, synthesis, and maintenance, which controls the longevity of an animal by uh, doing what the name should suggest. When molecules composing the synthesis and maintenance processes themselves eventually succumb to the same irreparable reduced states of energy, that is, the repair shops are now aging, then uh, aging becomes more manifest at uh, higher levels of organization. So the genome, unlike in aging, the genome indirectly determines longevity. The genome governs, uh, governs events, of course, from life's beginning until reproductive maturation, after which many of the events that it continues to govern are overtaken by the aging process or the dispersal of energy unrepaired. So in youth, the, there is terrific efficiency in repair and maintenance processes. And of course, that's favored over the, over the mounting loss of molecular structures. After reproductive success, the balance slowly shifts to a state where the loss of molecular structure begins to exceed repair and maintenance. So the genome indirectly determines longevity. Unlike the stochastic or accidental processes that characterize aging, longevity determination is not a random process. Longevity is governed by the enormous excess or, uh, uh, of, or what some people call physiological reserve that's reached at the time of reproductive maturation. The redundancy is achieved through natural selection to better guarantee survival to the age of reproductive success. Many people believe that that's why we have a pair of kidneys instead of one, excess lung capacity, enormous excess physiological capacity in youth that better guarantees survival to, the, to reproductive success. It's very much like the redundant systems that engineers introduce into complex uh, um, orbiting uh, satellites. So the determination of longevity is incidental to the main goal of the genome, which is to reach reproductive maturity. Now let's compare the age determinants and longevity determinants. Longevity determination is an entirely different process from the aging process. And you can think of it this way, I think it's rather simple. One might think of longevity determination as the energy state of molecules before they incur age changes. Or why do we live as long as we do? You also might think of aging as the state of molecules as they continue to incur irreparable uh, uh, changes and become dysfunctional. And you might ask, why do things eventually go wrong? So that's the simple distinction between these two phenomena. Aging then is a catabolic process that is chance driven. Longevity determination is an anabolic process that indirectly is genome driven. Now let's move to the third aspect of the finitude of life age-associated diseases, an area that I think most of you are more interested in. Why is aging not a disease? This question has been posed for many decades, and I'd like to give you what information I'm aware of that tells me at least, and I might say many, many other people, that aging is not a disease. There are six reasons for this belief. First, Age changes occur in every animal that reaches a fixed size in adulthood. And I'll, I'll address that condition later. That is why this fixed size is critical. <clears throat> Age changes cross virtually every species barrier, unlike any disease. We don't know of any disease that crosses every species barrier. 
Age change, unlike any disease, age changes occur in all species members only after the age of reproductive maturation. Another unique property of aging. Fourth, age, unlike any disease, age changes occur in wild animals protected by humans after that species probably has not experienced aging for thousands or millions of years. One good example is uh, someone finding a new species in the wild, taking it to a zoo, and uh, after a specific period of time, finds that the animal is undergoing age changes. And the probability of that occurring in the wild is very remote. Very, there are very few animals that age in the wild. If they do, it is because humans essentially have perturbed their environment to the extent that their predators or other conditions have changed, allowing them to go down further on the slope from maximum physiological capacity to less capacity. And fourth, uh, sorry, fifth, unlike any disease, age, age changes increase the vulnerability to pathology and death in all animals in which it occurs. Finally, age changes have the same universal molecular etiology, that is thermodynamic instability, in both anim animate and inanimate objects. So aging is not a disease because there is no disease or pathology that shares these six criteria that characterize the aging process. <clears throat> Will disease resolution increase our understanding of the fundamental biology of aging? This is a very important question that many lay people um, and unfortunately many decision makers in this field uh, don't understand in my judgment. Our success in resolving childhood diseases like polio, iron deficiency, anemia, or Wilms tumors did not increase our understanding of childhood development. Similarly, the resolution of the leading causes of death will also not provide any new insights into the biology of aging. Let us assume that all the leading causes of death written on death certificates were to be resolved. The key phrase here is written on death certificates. In developed countries, there could only be an increase in life expectancy. This is, of course, average life expectancy. That word is understood uh, of about 15 years. Life expectancy at birth in the United States today is about 79 years. So about 94 years would be the maximum uh, average life expectation at birth if all of the major causes of diseases on death certificates were re resolved. Um, this is a reference for that statement. Here is an example of what I've just mentioned. Uh, what would be the increase in life expectancy if the leading causes of death are resolved? Let's look first at cardiovascular disease and stroke. The approximate increase in, in, in years, again, average, average, at birth about 6.7 years, at age 65 about 6.2, there's not a tremendous difference. If cancer were resolved tomorrow morning, about 3.4 years of additional life expectation would be found for people born tomorrow. And at age 65, for those people age 65 tomorrow, about 2.2 years. If accidents were somehow under control, which of course is probably an impossibility, you would get a significantly less increase in life expectancy. And all other causes uh, give you the sums that you see listed here. Now, uh, the way these numbers are uh, achieved is to simply assume, for example, that you have uh, cured causes of death from cardiovascular disease tomorrow morning, and you then distribute, then you find the number of people in that cohort, then you distribute the proportion of people dying from the remaining causes amongst that group in order to achieve the figures that you see here. So it's a rather simple kind of arithmetic. This is a reference for the numbers that you see above. What then would cause death? The manifestations of the aging process would be the cause of death. The aging process 
which usually contends, con, uh, begins well before most age-associated diseases appear, would continue. We'd have to invent a new vocabulary to put on death certificates to describe causes of death attributed to things like losses in physiological capacity in the liver, lungs, heart, or some, vital or some other vital organ. Why is it important to distinguish aging from disease? I'll give you several reasons. Some are non-scientific and some are scientific. Let's do the non-scientific ones first. If the distinction remains ignored, the decades-long severe imbalance where the funding of age-associated diseases exceeds the funding of research on the fundamental biology of aging by orders of magnitude, and this will continue. Second, this imbalance will continue because of the erroneous belief that the resolution of age-associated diseases will provide insights into the fundamental biology of aging or the determinants of longevity. A couple more non-scientific reasons. The distinction is essential to counter the widespread myth that disease prevention or resolution will slow or stop the aging process. Finally, the erroneous belief is this erroneous belief is the basis for the popularity and the financial success, if I might say that, of the anti-aging industry, who in my judgment promote alleged disease prevention, not a bad thing, of course, but the wrong conclusion is that the prevention of disease will slow or stop the fundamental aging process. And I don't believe that that is a valid assumption. Now, these are some scientific reasons for that statement. Research on the fundamental biology of aging could reveal that the increase in vulnerability to all age-associated diseases is rooted in some fundamental property found in old but not in young cells. The probability that this is true is the universal belief that aging is the greatest risk factor for all age-associated diseases. Here are final scientific reasons. The belief that research on age-associated diseases will yield information on the fundamental biology of aging misleads investigators into asking inappropriate questions when designing and interpreting experiments. And finally, research data on age-associated diseases that demonstrates the delayed appearance or elimination of the, whatever disease is being studied cannot be interpreted to have affected the aging process, despite the fact that the population under study might live longer, lives longer because the, diseases, the disease to which they were prone has been eliminated. There's only one intervention that has increased human life expectancy. It's only been increased by preventing, resolving, or delaying the manifestations of disease or, or pathology. And that's the kind of thing that many of you folks are engaged in. Human life expectancy has not increased as a result of human interventions in such things as longevity determining processes or the aging process itself or, as many of you here know full well, cover-ups. Um, I'd like now to move to a different subject, and that is some fundamental biological aspects of this field. One of them, strangely enough, well, uh, since we're so sure of our, all of our ages, usually, the, the determination of the age of living things. What is the age of a clone population? This is a an aspen tree grove. Many of you know that aspen trees replicate by the roots of the trees spreading out and giving rise to new trees from the ends of the root system that, of course, is underground. So when you look at a forest of aspen trees, you might be persuaded to believe that each tree started individually but they actually arose from the entangled root system that you would find underground. So the question is, how old is each one of these trees? The same thing is true for creosote bushes, 
which have been found to be an enormously old, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Here is a laboratory in which cloning is being done on, uh, on uh, commercially important flowers. And again, we would have the problem of determining the age of an individual flower if a piece, a tiny bit of a leaf is removed periodically from successive generations in order to produce a new clonal population. The question then becomes how old is each of the individuals? Finally, many of you might be familiar with what are popularly called fairy rings, that is uh, uh, fungi whose underground mycelial system uh, spreads like spokes in a wheel annually so that at each year the wheel, so to speak, gets uh, uh, larger and larger. So, and the same question arises, how old are these uh, mushrooms at the periphery of these rings? So bi defining biological aging is, is very difficult in many circumstances. The quaking aspen that I showed you before, uh, some of them have estimated ages of 10,000 years, and I'll make a comment about these numbers in a few minutes. The creosote bush, you see the number here, and the and bracken fern is at about 1,400. We all have heard of bristlecone pines and redwood trees being thousands of years old. I'm going to try to persuade you that those of you who are older than about 30 are older than any bristlecone pine or redwood tree. And the reasoning goes like this. The trees are not the oldest living things, as it's usually uh, uh, said, because the only living tissue in a redwood tree or bristlecone pine are found in the needles and the roots and in the cambium layer, which is the layer immediately below the bark. The substance beyond that is not living. And the oldest cells in the living part, living parts of these trees is no more than about 30 years. So to argue that the, cell, that the tree is 2,000 years old is uh, erroneous because what is old is very dead. The tree simply is able to hang on to its cells for architectural purpose in order to rise higher and higher. Whereas for, for example, you and I, slough our dead cells off every day and don't get bigger and bigger as a result of hanging on to our dead cells. So if, if you find a branch of a redwood tree on the forest floor, you wouldn't argue that it's old in respect to referring to it as being alive. You might refer to it as being old in respect to when it fell from the tree. So this uh, idea of uh, these tree, trees being as old as they are is erroneous in the sense that the cells that are alive are only 30 years old. Of course the, cell has, the tree has stood there for many years, but what you're looking at and in, in a redwood tree and what you're looking at when you look around this room is the leading edge of a cell lineage that began millions of years ago. So it's illogical to call a life form an oldest living thing, as I just mentioned. And I don't know if you want to believe this or not, but if you are older than 30, your muscle cells and neurons are older than these trees because everything else is turned over. In fact, when you celebrate your birthday, those are the only things you should be celebrating, the age of your muscle cells and neurons. Everything else is too young. Do life forms exist that do not age? I made a side remark about that earlier. Let's see what this is all about. There are life forms that age either imperceptibly to give them the benefit of the doubt because we can't measure it, or they don't age at all. Aging in some animals either doesn't occur or the rate can't be measured, if indeed it's possible to measure rates of aging. 
The phenomenon occurs mostly in animals that do not reach a fixed size in adulthood. You and I, of course, reach a fixed size in adulthood. But there are many animals that don't. So as a guiding principle, animals that continue to get bigger and bigger and bigger don't age. And examples, I've given some examples here. Deep sea fish, lobsters, uh, sport fish, some amphibians. I'll show you uh, more about this in a moment. What are, the, what are the criteria for no or slow aging? Well, here are the generally accepted, uh, sorry. Um, I'll come to that slide in a moment. These are examples of the kinds of animals I, I mentioned earlier. This is an American lobster, believe it or not, that weighs more than 50 pounds. Uh, and I think some even uh, heavier than that have been found recently. This animal continues to grow, despite the fact that most of the ones that we're familiar with are very small, captured when they're in their youth. Uh, alligators are also animals that apparently do not age. Billfish, Galapagos tortoise, uh, deep sea cold water fish, like these guys. These are the criteria that I mentioned earlier that, uh, that tells us that these animals are probably not aging. First of all, there's no increase in age-specific mortality. The mortality rates seem to be at the same no matter how old the animals are uh, chronologically. There's no decrease in the rate of reproductive capacity after sexual maturation. That 50-pound lobster produces, if it's a female, as many eggs as a three- or four-year-old lobster. There's no decrease in peak physiological capacity, in, including immunity to disease. One interesting study that was done about 10 or 15 years ago measured the closing speed of the major claw of a 30 or 40 pound lobster with a three or four year old one and the closing speed of the closure in both animals was identical and as many of you know at least for humans um, our, uh, our uh, responses in respect to speed of neurological reactions uh, slows in many uh, aspects then there are ageless fish, orange roughy. Extreme longevity in these animals is still a mystery. And this is one that you might be interested in. This was uh, known until several years ago as the Patagonian toothfish. It is uh, a very, it can live for very many years. A, a merchandiser or, or marketer decided that although this, the flesh of this fish tasted very good, it would never sell if its name appeared on a menu. So they changed the name to Chilean sea bass. And that's what you eat. This fish, formerly known as the Patagonian toothfish. We know nothing about its age. In fact, a dinner-sized piece of Chilean seed bass is anywhere from 50 to 100 years old. We know nothing about its aging. It is now, as is orange ruffy, a very threatened species. And I beg you, if you have enough courage to do so, not to eat this fish. In fact, the restaurants in San Francisco decided about five or eight years ago not to sell this, these two fish. This is apparently the longest lived non-colonial marine invertebrate known. It was discovered about 12 years ago. Many of you, of course, are familiar with the discovery of the deep sea hydrothermal vents better known as black smokers. <clears throat> this is the giant tube worm, and it is the longest lived non-colonial marine vertebrate, as I mentioned. It, require, it requires about 170 to 250 years to reach two meters in length, and many of them are that length and, and many even longer. 
So we're led to believe that this is an extraordinarily long-lived animal. So the question is, how do these animals escape what appears to be the aging process? The probable reason, we have no good evidence for the absence of aging or its extremely slowed rate, is the presence of more efficient repair and maintenance systems or the longevity determinants. Of course, that's saying something without evidence. The reason we don't have evidence is very peculiar. The National Institute on Aging and found private foundations that support research in this field have for some reasons that I cannot fathom, despite my efforts to change their minds, do not invest in research on animals that do not age. And I cannot give you a better answer than that. There have been a few studies done to understand why these animals don't age. Um, but they have revealed very little useful information. And it remains a very neglected area of research in this field. The longest lived mammal that we thought was, were humans until about 10 or 15 years ago is no longer the longest lived mammal. We now know that the longest lived mammal is a bowhead whale. And this was discovered in a very, rather interesting way it was discovered, first of all, by looking at aspartic acid racemization in the eye globes of these animals. Uh, some of you may know that the am amino acids change from the L form to the D form over a fixed period of time, and that can be measured. And it was found that, these, uh, that the uh, eye globes of this mammal uh, made a determination of the ages that you see indicated here. And no pathology has been found in animals of those ages. And finally, the most curious uh, bit of evidence was this. It was found in some of these animals, Inuit spear points, that are changed in their architecture every eight or 10 years as a result of the uh, of bettering their ability to kill a whale by the Inuits so that you can determine from the spear points that are still found in the bowheads uh, the, their approximate age by knowing that that particular spearhead was made at a particular time. And this is especially true of those made in the early part of the 20th century and the latter part, <coughs> latter part of the 19th century. And uh, there's a reference there for that. So now it's generally believed that the bowhead whale is the oldest living ma mammal. Another question that is a deeper one but very significant is how old is a living form if all of its molecules turn over periodically? Most of our cells present today were formed no more than a few years ago. Some were formed a few minutes ago, or even fractions of a second ago. We do know, I'm sorry, we don't know, of any cells or molecules present at birth that survive to our present age. After about 50 population doublings, the smallest molecules are diluted to the vanishing point. So the essential quality of sameness disappears. If all of our cells or the molecules that compose them turn over in only a few years, then what is celebrated on our birthdays? The only thing that apparently doesn't age, I say apparently and I'll qualify that in a minute, is DNA. But even in gametes and their precursors, that DNA is not immortal, despite Weissman's claim that germ cells are immortal, something that all of us have learned in our first year biology class. But the information that the genome contains comes close because DNA turns over. So that what seems to be immortal, although not, again, not quite, is the message 
the information, not the physical entity that determines the information. But because of the essential role of mutations and the recombina and recombination information in, in DNA does change, otherwise evolution would be impossible. So the only aspect of biology that approaches but, not a, but does not achieve immortality is the flow of information. Some I would like to make a few final comments and I'll end in a couple of minutes and hopefully have a few minutes for questions. There's relative, and these comments that I'm making now are going to be more political and scientific, but I feel an urge to mention them to this group. There is relatively little support for research on the biology of aging. And the reason for this is that contrary to popular belief, no research support is directed toward understanding, as I mentioned earlier, the fundamental biology of human aging that is remotely comparable to the support for research on age-associated diseases. For example, in recent years, less than 5% of the NIA budget was spent on research on aging. Half the budget is spent, still is spent, on Alzheimer's disease research. Not that that's bad, don't get me wrong, but the resolution of Alzheimer's disease as a cause of death would, would add about 19 days on to life expectancy, mainly because people usually don't die of Alzheimer's disease. They may die with Alzheimer's disease. And furthermore, the agony and the pain and the, and, the, and the suffering that Alzheimer's disease patients incur is no different than that which is incurred by people who suffer from the leading causes of death, cardiovascular disease, stroke, and cancer. It's long been a mystery for, for me to understand why Alzheimer's disease research uh, eclipses the energy and funding for other uh, causes of death. There's some reasons for this, but I don't have time to go into them now. Another important consideration is the term aging research. It really embraces all aspects of the finitude of life, and even more than that, but biogerontologists, we've tried to distinguish ourselves by putting that, that bio in front of gerontologists, do research on the fundamental biology of aging, which is only a very small part of the general term aging research. There is a common belief held especially by policymakers and funding agencies that to fund aging research means to fund research on age-associated diseases and that this will somehow provide insights into the fundamental biology of aging. It won't. And that's become, in my judgment, a $1 billion misunderstanding. The most important question in research on the biology of aging is this. At the cell level, the main question is, why are old cells more vulnerable to disease and pathology than our young cells? And at the molecular level, the question is, what modifications occur in functional biomolecules that result in age changes and increase vulnerability to age-associated pathology? So the most important question in research on longevity determinants is, how can the energetic states of functional biomolecules be maintained longer? And some of you may have answers to that. This is the physician's mantra. I think that you will find this mentioned in the first paragraph of many papers in uh, geriatric medicine, and you'll also find uh, people talking about their interests uh, starting their discussion by saying this. The greatest risk factor for the leading causes of death is the aging process. Well, I don't think it takes too much of a leap of intelligence to say, then why is the funding for research on the fundamental biology of aging infinitesimal when compared to the funding for research on age-associated diseases? The answer is, uh, the probable answer is that it's infinitesimal 
because uh, of the failure of many to distinguish aging from disease. Thank you very much. Well, I'm ready to be shot down. Who, where is the first rifle shot coming from? My question, I'm Dr. Jeff White. My question is, uh, what role do you think the telomerase activators, what role can they play in slowing the aging process, slowing the, the aging of cells? Well, first of all, we have no, dir no direct evidence, and I mean direct evidence, that telomerase expression uh, is a significant factor in the aging process. Telomerase expression is generally associated with the presence of cancer cells. And the simple answer, which is undoubtedly wrong is to say that expressing telomerase will just inc increase the likelihood of cancer. But it is also known that virtually every cell does produce minute amounts of telomerase. And in fact, uh, blast cell populations or stem cell populations uh, produce detectable amounts of telomerase. So, so the expression of telomerase apparently is necessary for replication even at levels less than those found in cancer cells that uh, become immortal as a result of the expression of telomerase, which in those cells is expressed at much greater detectable amounts than in normal cells. So I um, um, don't have very much confidence in the belief that tampering with telomerase expression is going to tell us very much about the aging process. Thank you. Yeah, first I'd like to uh, express our appreciation for accepting our invitation to give us this brilliant summary of biogerontology as you've done, uh, because you've covered a lot of different bases and given us a lot of food for thought. I have a particular question, however, because in the talk you said that there were creatures that achieved a fixed life size over their life history, uh, but that bristlecone pine trees as plants, you know, added new dead cells to their architecture, and that was the reason why they appeared to be 5,000 years old instead of 30 years old. But I vaguely remember that in the biology courses that you taught back at Stanford, in 1974 that there were sea anemones or other sea creatures that achieved a fixed size but did not age or had negligible senescence. Are there such creatures? Yes, you're right. At, the, at about that time, the sea, sea anemone, anemone was thought to be uh, ageless. Uh, they were kept by, believe it or not, several people in the United Kingdom kept them more or less as pets. and. Uh, other evidence indicated that they were living for an indefinite period of time. However, what was not measured and what's key in this, this discussion is cell turnover. There, uh, although it wasn't measured and has to be, there is no evidence that the cells in a sea anemone today are the same as those found, let's say, two, three, four, five, ten, or fifty years ago. So if there's cell turnover, you cannot argue that you have the same animal sitting in that spot, if it's immovable, as you had uh, decades ago. Cell turnover and molecular turnover are essential in, the, in, in whatever definition you make for the word immortality. Harvey Bartonoff, San Francisco. Thank you, Doctor, for your excellent overview and presentation. Uh, a comment and then a, a question about speculation. Uh, in the mouse model of activating telomerase either with a gene vector or with uh, telomerase activator supplement, uh, telomerase was increased and in 
uh, several generations, life expectancy was uh, increased without an increase in cancer. And those data, of course, are published. Could, could you comment on that? And then the second question is, a hundred years ago, the leading cause of death amongst humans was infectious diseases, and assumedly through vaccines and antibiotics and overall cleaner water and food. That's no longer the case. Uh, data were presented to the American Heart Association recently that the age-related uh, mortality due to cardiovascular disease, a heart attack, stroke, and uh, is actually decreasing if they continue as the current data are going by the year 2020 such that cancer will be the leading cause of death amongst humans in the Western world. What would you project to be the most common cause of death going out 50 to 100 years from today? Well, in respect to your first question, I'm not sure I understand it, but I think you're referring to the work of Ron DePino. Yes, and Dr. Maria Blasco and others, yes. Yes. Uh, well, if memory serves, this experiments were done, I think, about 10 years ago or 8 years ago. <clears throat> the, um, the second or third generation of those animals had significant um, uh, physical anomalies. Uh, but even if that were not true, what those folks are working with are aspects of longevity determination, not aging. First of all, they, there are no generally accepted criteria for measuring aging in, for example, a mouse, to say nothing of humans. We have no generally accepted criteria. And, in, and, and the other comment is that if they are measuring the occurrence of death in a particular cohort to determine longevity, then what they are looking at is what is called all-cause mortality. They do not know the cause of death in the dozens or hundreds of animals that they're looking at, and they're giving data expressed only in respect to uh, not knowing the causes of death, which is called all-cause mortality. That would be very much like not, not knowing the cause of death in humans, simply stating the age of death or age of the individuals at death, and then arguing that they're all dying of old age. Well, we know that's not true. We know that we all die from essentially different causes, although they might be narrowing now. Um, in respect to your uh, second question, I'm not sure again uh, precisely what you want. There's no way for me to predict what the future holds in respect to what the causes of death will be. But um, uh, the leading causes of death today, at least in developed countries, are fairly well known, although that requires some, some serious comment as well. Essentially, we really do not know the cause of death in humans over roughly the age of 80 or 85. It is a black box. What a physician writes on a death certificate is usually guesswork. In fact, and I can give you all the data that you want on this point, autopsies that have been done on where large large enough numbers of autopsies have been done on people in various parts of the world, the error rate of what was written on the death certificate and what was then found at autopsy is about 40 percent. So when you look at the cause of death data with a 40 percent error rate, that should really give you some pause in interpretation. Um, as a matter of fact, cancer as a cause of death doesn't continue logarithmically or even uh, uh, arithmetically uh, to old age. It, it tails off. And in fact, if you look at Gompert's equation uh, results, you find that after the age of 85, the, the, rate, the likelihood of death decreases. It doesn't increase, it decreases. Detectably, there have been several papers written on this. Yes. Thank you. Well, I, I, that brought up a comment. I have another 
question, but the comment was, I was dying. My mother died at 93, and I had to write out the death certificate. And I couldn't figure out to say what she died of. She died of old age. Everything was falling apart. There wasn't any single issue. And she's like my car. I drive them until they fall apart. I don't know what the final issue is that causes them to quit the car to quit running. The Mercedes was when it was raining out, and my foot went through the floorboard. But the, uh, my, wife, my, my mother was sort of like that. But uh, it was just multiple, everything was falling apart. But my question is, I, th I think of the cell, like a, the aging of a single cell. And the, does the second law of thermodynamics really apply? That's entropy. That is, a cell, an energetic cell, will always have disorder increased in every, every issue. And finally, like the heat death of the universe, entropy uh, causes that cell to finally no longer function in an in a, in a energetic system correctly. Dis you know, entropy is disorder, so to speak. Pardon? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm having a great deal of difficulty understanding your question. Could you... Well, does, does, does the limitation of a single cell, does entropy, that is the second law of thermodynamics, is that the limiting function that causes ultimate disorder in the cell so it no longer can function in a, what we'll recognize as a cell and it falls apart functionally? I'm sorry, I still do not understand your question. Could somebody else uh, well, help me? Well, the second law of thermodynamics says every, every useful piece of work that we do, like friction, when you pull something, that's entropy, that's disorder. And that's no longer a functional, orderly thing. It goes off into, into a, well, quantum mechanics. And I think that applies to a single cell and probably all of our functioning. I was a physics major, so maybe that isn't right. I, I think the only um, resolution of my problem is to please come forward after I'm finished. I and will do that. We'll discuss it privately, yeah. because Thank I'm you. still having a great deal of difficulty. All right. I read a case report about a group of meditators in the Bay Area who increased the telomere length by meditating over a six-month period of time. What would be your comments on psychological stress and the aging process in humans? Well, curiously enough, there is a developing rather large literature on stress, the effects of stress on telomere attrition and uh, many other aspects of life that uh, seem on the surface not to be fundamental bi biological uh, activities, but more uh, social or psychological. And there is a large literature on this now, and I, I urge you to look at it. I cannot answer your question directly other than to say it is a very great interest and in being studied by many people at this moment. Yes, please. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hayflick. Uh, wonderful, uh, I would say, overview and thought, new ways of thinking about aging versus disease because uh, this is something most of us are just not doing. As you're right, money is just not being poured into the area of, as you said, aging rather than comorbidities. Question, two questions. One. What are your thoughts about caloric restriction? Number two. I'm sorry, say that again. Caloric restriction. Yes. Number, question one. Question two, the work of Kenyon and others on knockout mice with IGF-1, growth hormone, insulin, those factors, and extending the life of it, mice, nematodes, and etc. What are your thoughts? Well, in respect to the work of Kenyon and others who work with invertebrates and even work with mice, as I indicated before, what they are what, when they look at a variable, and you've named a few, the determination of the effects of that variable is on all-cause mortality. They do not know 
what the individual cause of death is in each of those nematodes or drosophila or mice in many cases, not in all cases, so that what they are looking at is the effect of a variable on all cause mortality. To then conclude that that variable had an effect on aging is nonsense. You do not know what the causes. It is similar to what I explained earlier, and that is that if we didn't know the cause of death in humans and we knew that everyone died at a particular age, whatever it was, and then argued that everybody dies of old age, we know darn well that's not true. And this is a serious problem with the folks who work in that field. Now, to give them the credit that they're due, what they are studying are elements of longevity determination. They are not studying the aging process. Um, now, your second question had to do with caloric was restriction. The, the caloric restriction issue. Yes. Well, uh, I hate to... Just a couple of minutes. Just a couple of seconds. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm told I just have a couple of seconds, so I'm going to give you a very short answer. Um, the problem with caloric restriction experiments is a very serious one. First of all, not all animals behave as others do in respect to their longevity increasing as a result of a decrease in caloric intake. But more importantly, the animals that are under study with caloric restrict restriction are being compared with controls that are arbitrarily fed more calories. Now, the basis for the number of calories being fed to the controls is key in understanding whether caloric restriction is working or not. And finally, even in the wild, uh, if you find, you, you find that caloric restriction is in fact the usual way of an animal living. An animal in the wild lives either on, in conditions of feast or famine. And if you mimic those conditions in the laboratory, you get the kind of longevity that you would get in animals that are, that are protected from predation, disease, and, and uh, accidents in the wild. So that what you have uncovered with caloric restriction experiments is exactly how long an animal lives in, under feral circumstances. Thank you very much.